On April 4th, 2010, an eight-year-old me realized that my much-beloved Nintendo Wii was backwards compatible with the GameCube, so I went to GameStop, picked up a crappy opportunity-market controller and a copy of Mario Sunshine, because this guy named Chugga Conroy was playing it at the time, and it looked kind of neat. For that matter, his whole spiel of playing old video games for an audience of 95,000 people was quite appealing on its own. As such, for my birthday in the following weeks, I asked for a flip video camcorder and a copy of Mario 64 from the Wii's Virtual Console, with the exact same intent in mind. What resulted initially, I can say with hindsight, was a very obscure, crappy Let's Play channel on YouTube in a sea of thousands, but eventually, after 10 years, those few purchases have rippled into a full-blown collection of over 500 games and a lifelong hobby of making videos about it. A lot of things have changed since I was 9 years old. I can actually write a script, for one thing, but these two facets of my life have persisted off of nothing but fervent passion, and also a lot of money, I guess. Seeing as how I have more than 50% of my life to speak for by now, I feel like the 10-year anniversary of these cursory events justify letting out some penned-up experiences. Although I have made a few cursory videos online and offline for my own sake, my collection and my online presence have never been particularly close, and because there are so many people in this hobby nowadays, I figured that I could offer some good insight on how I got from this to this. I'm also in a bit of a unique position to talk because I got into collecting from interest rather than nostalgia. Plus, even though I couldn't have possibly been collecting from a younger age, I still wasn't early enough to reap the benefits of a smaller market. It's 80, 90, even a hundred dollars nowadays. And in the near future, it's probably going to be trending up to $150, so... Couple that with living in rural Bumble Frick, Kansas, and you have some pretty unique tales to tell. As such, here are a few stories from 10 years of collecting video games. I started off collecting GameCube games because it's what I knew best, my cousins had one and they were still being liquidated for dirt cheap at GameStop. Thankfully, I had the good sense to keep a few of the price tags on my first purchases and they are absolutely cathartic to gawk at 10 years later. One of the first games I picked up was Super Smash Bros. Melee for, I want to say $20. It was actually the first T-rated game that I had ever played and because my mom was actually a responsible adult, I knew it wouldn't be easy to convince her to let me buy it. Here's the thing though, I didn't buy Super Smash Bros. Melee because it's one of the most critically games of all time, nor did they pick it up because I let YouTube Let's Players influence my taste. What's sick and twisted about this guy is- He's now withholding one chance for his government, but two! No, the reason I picked this game up was because it was still spinning around in a kiosk in 2010 at my local dentist. I don't know how or why, but from the first moment I walked into that building until around 2012, there was a barely functional copy of Super Smash Bros. Melee available to play in the waiting room. It's probably the single strangest way you could find out about a video game, much less Super Smash Bros. freaking Melee, but it was there. This is why living in rural Kansas is in equal parts amazing and terrifying. It was from this context that my mom was comfortable with letting me buy the game for myself. As such, from the age of 9, I accidentally bought my first expensive game. I would continue hitting up GameStop locations across the state through 2011 or so, when they finally stopped carrying GameCube games, and I basically haven't collected GameCube games, or been to GameStop for that matter, ever since. No, it's not the cover. This is the cover. It is freaking off the chain. That's because I stumbled upon what was once an absolute haven for retro video games eBay. Around July 2010, I picked up an N64 alongside Diddy Kong Racing with a manual, Donkey Kong 64, and Mario Party for maybe a total of $60. I also picked up Mario Kart 64 and Super Smash Bros. 64 from the Wii's Virtual Console around the same time. From 2011 to 2013, N64 was basically my main console because there was still something incredibly novel to me about buying these ancient yet uncovered relics from 14 years ago and formerly known as cartridges. In February 2011, I got my first video game complete in its original box. This is gonna be good. Might as well look at the coolest box art in history. Ooh, Glover, it's so cool. So cool. Ninjas, on the other hand, tastes good. But Glover is fun. But Mentos are from the Jew. At the time, aside from maybe Worms, Armageddon, and Clay Fighter Sculptor's Cut, basically nothing on the N64 couldn't be had for less than $20, and all the games came in indestructible plastic cartridges, so it was a pretty good first console for someone as young and fervent as I was. I picked up Ocarina of Time for like $4, I later got physical boxed copies of Mario 64 and Mario Kart 64 for less than $30 a piece, and I even came within inches of buying Super Bowling for $11. 
I regret not buying Super Bowling for $11. Aside from this though, I was still very much so eager to expand my horizon. In particular, I wanted to get the hot console that everyone on Nintendo Age was talking about. The NES. Alright, um, this is going to be my NES collection. Burger Time is a five screw game. Another five screw game. If uh, there's a five screw five screw version of it I have it. Another five screw game that I have. I'm really interested in that five screw whole thing in the what's it. Metroid is a in fact a girl. The five screw version of this is unfortunately not the five screw variant. Of course it's a five screw variant. There's also a five screw variant of this. This is the five screw variant. It can get repetitive if you, if you play it repeatedly. So that was the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't commit suicide. I asked for it for Christmas in 2010, but I didn't get it. I then asked for it for Christmas in 2011, but I didn't get it. Later, I asked for it for Christmas in 2012, but I didn't get it. Later, I asked for it for my birthday in 2013, and I finally got it after a lot of nosy reassuring. As I'm sure we've all done at some point in our lives, don't lie to me. By this point, the NES had already started to blow up in price, so I missed my opportunity to get anything for super cheap. As such, my first year collecting NES was extremely fervent. Given all I had learned up until this point about the N64, I knew that the sooner you got into buying games for an old system, the better off you would be. As such, I scrounged up every bit of money that I possibly could and put it all into the NES. I ended the year with about 28 games, notable among them being copies of Stack Up for $38, Bomberman 2 for $67, and Fire and Ice for $71, the latter two actually being Christmas gifts, and it was a strategy that proved to be successful, so for as long as I collected NES, I always had my eyes on expensive games. One particular instance I should mention is Color a Dinosaur. I always wanted this game in my collection as a joke, and I made no secret of it. In fact, it became a bit of an in-joke for me to randomly ask my mom to buy me a copy. Of course, I was also 12, going on 13, so that delivery was always best served with an almighty voice crack! And on to the stupid dumb everybody hates. Water level! Wee. I'm sorry, I'm probably gonna edit that pun out. <laughs> or I'm just gonna edit everything else out and leave the pun in. That, that's probably what I'm gonna do, actually. In retrospect, I think it's safe to say that I went through puberty on easy mode. I've had this exact voice since I was 13 years old, I've been this exact height since I was 15 years old, and quite conveniently I'm also asexual, so I was able to dodge the entire idea of being depressed and hopelessly romantic and all that other junk that I've been told is rather popular with the kitties. I own about 69 NES games currently. Pointing into this story for all of the wrong reasons is that I was even able to grow facial hair at the age of 12, and my mom hated it. Mostly as a joke, but also with the faint hope that it would actually work, I held my fledgling mustache for ransom by trying to trade it for rare NES games. So in other words, there were actually unironically multiple occasions when I came up to my mom and said, yeah, I'll shave my mustache with due time. But first, we gotta talk about negotiating a copy of Color a Dinosaur on the NES. Then I think we can actually talk here. If anyone else in the history of mankind has ever done this, let me know. I went at this for literal months. In fact, the great thing about making videos alongside this process is how you can vaguely see the blurry silhouette of my mustache slowly looming in on the horizon. Finally, around April 2014, I somehow erode my mom's willpower away to the tune of one free copy of Color a Dinosaur. In exchange for shaving. That's the kind of kid I was. To this day, Color a Dinosaur remains one of my proudest and also most embarrassing, but mostly just proudest, cornerstones of my collection. Even though I don't collect for NES anymore, I am never getting rid of it. Like clockwork, I made a review of the game as soon as I got my hands on it, clean shave and all, male privilege is real, and it is winning a free copy of an obscure 21-year-old educational video game because you refuse to trim your mustache for a long enough period of time. End of story. By this point, my NES collection had grown to be quite massive, and there were no signs of stopping. Color a Dinosaur was something like game number 45, and I ended 2014 with about 70. The byproduct of this, however, is something that plagues even the most careful of collectors. Space. On New Year's Day 2015, I moved my entire setup across the room thanks in large parts of the corner was tucked in, being extremely claustrophobic with this Scott the Waz having Wasteland judging my every life decision. A good few weeks later, you basically have my current setup. It is nostalgic looking back on my old corner, but only having two walls to put things up against is not a good way to live your life under any circumstances. Plus, this renovation marked the point at which I actually went out of my way to cater for my collection. To some extent, it was the end of an era and the start of a new one. Hello everyone, and this is Mario Party 1, initially released in 1998, December of that year, in Japan, and the party worthy 1999 in the US, um, in TSC regions, rather. 
Let's depart for adventure and do a 50 turn game, shall we? You have got to be kidding! Let's <laughs> win that! You don't need more coins! Oh, you got to be kidding! Oh, oh come on! this video, I've said a lot about the games that I'm willing to buy, but I haven't gotten much into the games that I actually play. I'm not someone who collects just for the sake of collecting, and my internet presence has probably made it more than obvious by now that I'm very passionate about gaming as a whole. To that end, 2017 was the year where my taste in games really started to take form. For one thing, 2015 to 2016 were not very prolific years for my collection. In 2015, I basically just forged onward with my NES collection, finally breaking 100 games by Christmas, with a special highlight being Dragon Fighter. I am very glad I picked it up when I did. And my N64 collection also got a nice boost in 2016, going from 26 games to around 70. All things considered, however, I was slowly getting bored of my Nintendo and also Atari 2600 if you want to go that far ethno state. As such, throughout 2017, I largely picked up new systems in place of new games. In February, I picked up my much beloved Mega Drive on a whim with nothing but a copy of Cyborg Justice to keep me company. It also came with an RF cable instead of composite, which I don't even think I need to elaborate on why that's terrible. It was like this for months, too, but I appreciated the power cleanser for what it was worth. Of course, now, the Mega Drive is my favorite system of all time with 50 plus games in my collection, it's also the only system I have an EverDrive for and the only retro system I have fit for component, but back in early 2017, it wasn't the Sega console that I wanted the most. Um, and I'm also planning on selling good, uh, a good chunk of the games. I think this is like 18 or 19 or so, and there's also a couple box ones like right here. Um, so that's gonna help fund uh, Wii collecting and collecting and maybe Saturn collecting somewhere down the line. That distinction would go to the Sega Saturn, because I was and still am an absolute lunatic. In all seriousness, it's difficult to overstate just how much you need to hate yourself before you love the Saturn, but for one reason or another, I got into the system hard. I looked on at other people's collections with envy, especially Joe's from GameSack. In fact, if there's any one person I have to blame for thinking it's a good idea to blow over $100 on a video game, it's probably him. The Saturn itself also started my lifelong habit of buying games before I even owned the system. I picked up Starfighter and Worldwide Saga Sega International Victory Goal Edition, that never gets any easier to say, locally for some comparatively modest prices. Either way, for my birthday that year, I was given a system alongside four other games, VR Soccer, Daytona USA, Virtua Fighter 2, and Virtua Cop. The listing I bought from even had two demo discs. This would have been more than enough for me to quench my appetite for the system, but after having been so desensitized to spending money, I kept looking. I both woefully regret and appreciated what I found as soon as it presented itself. An auction for a lot of six Sega Saturn games with hours to go and nobody bidding on it. I then clicked on the auction and was greeted with even more bittersweet reverence. Those games were Double Switch, Bust a Move 2, Bust a Move 3, A Stall, Panzer Dragoon Zwei, and best of all, Pebble Beach Golf Links! They were in beautiful condition, and thanks to the seller listing the auction in the wrong eBay category and also not having the default picture be of all six games at once, I was simply allowed a moment or two alone with these games, taking in the horrid realization that plagues collectors across the world I'm gonna have to bid on this, aren't I? The thing of it was, my birthday had already come and gone at this point, and no matter how much they would have ended up going for, it still would have been ludicrously cheap by the game's standards, but still far too much for me to convince my parents of lending their support. I only had a few hours to react, and once again the solution I formulated came from a petty squabble. You see, even though I'm from rural farmland in the middle of nowhere, and I probably live under the flattest, safest circumstances imaginable, I have never liked driving. I have always found it to be a nerve-wracking experience where anything could go wrong at any time and the result will always be inevitably death. Or if not, tens of thousands of dollars worth of damage, the likes of which you could have been putting into more Sega Saturn games, and I don't know which is the worst fate at that point. As such, I had been carefully evading getting a license for as long as possible. By this point, I was 16 years old, and the fear had not been lost on my parents. Alas, when you live in the middle of nowhere, you kind of have to drive in order to do anything. I knew every bit as much as my parents that this whole shenanigan had to end at some point. It just so happens that I was waiting for the right kind of day. May 21st, 2017 was that exact kind of day. 
I bartered with my mom that in exchange for letting me buy these games, I would begrudgingly start learning how to drive over the summer. And after some negotiating, I finally got her blessing. After what I can only describe as the most tense 30 minutes of my life, I won the auction for a grand total of $127. In other words, I jumpstarted my entire Saturn collection with a laundry list of must-have, sought-after titles for $21 per game. $21! Per. Game. Frick. With an entire collection of Saturn games available to me from the start, coupled with the world's largest sigh of relief and the hype machine building in the background, I could not begin to tell you how much I loved this console at first sight. Today, it remains my second favorite console of all time behind the Mega Drive, but it does take the cake for being the console that I love the most, for purely sentimental reasons. It's pretty much a glorified guilty pleasure house that also just so happens to have a massive supply of genuinely good content. With that said, collecting for seven years got me into the habit of dreaming big, and that auction was the first of many deals that would go on to characterize my Saturn collection. I think it's safe to say that every collector has their fair share of pipe dreams. For some people, it's a complete copy of Earthbound, for others, it's a little Samson, but for me, throughout all of 2017, it was Magic Knight Rayer. At the time, complete copies of Magic Knight Rares were running somewhere between $300 to $350. On the absolute lowest end, they could possibly reach $250. Needless to say, that was out of the question, but one day, I happened upon a loose copy of the game at auction running for only $160. I haphazardly bid on it, and I lost, but it still barely remained under $200. From then on, I knew that this game would barely be possible to get, but that sliver of a chance kept me going. I proceeded to indiscreetly hover over copies of this game on eBay from that point forward until one of them would be mine. Throughout the summer, a few more copies popped up with the same results. 150, 180, 190, all ridiculously expensive in their own rights, but not quite unattainable. My search would drag onward, and eventually I found my chance. It was a lovely Hikaru variant, and it was at auction for a price steadily below $100. For days, I closely monitored the listing. Usually, with highly sought-after rare games on obscure consoles with devout followings, the bourgeoisie hogs up any hopes and dreams of those below them by throwing a careless reserve price to guarantee that it goes to them no matter the cost. It's annoying, and it's robbed me of Magic Knight Rare several times before, but this copy was still amazingly clean at the end of its run. Sensing it as my opportunity, I put up my reserve of $135. Seeing as how it stayed out of the $100 range for this long, I was fairly confident that my bid was safe. Two seconds later, the auction was decidedly not safe. Someone put up a higher bid, and I clamored for the mouse, but it ended before I could get anything in. To this day, I don't think I've ever been more melodramatic about losing an auction. At $137, it was the cheapest I had ever seen, and it was even the variant that I wanted. But I was sniped at the last second, and I lost. Holy crap, I wish I was joking when I say that I could not do anything aside from thinking about what went wrong and what I could have done for the rest of the day. Alas, my vow had not expired. A few more months went by with nothing. They were all jumping back into the $180 to $200 range with absolutely no intent at ever climbing back down. Day in and day out, I saw copies of this game spring up and unceremoniously sell without any regard for price, but I still kept going. I had a bold, daring dream, built on hope and bound by chance, and I would not let this game slip from my grasp again. Finally, on October 5th, 2017, after over half a year of failing to win a copy at auction, this is what I wrote on my Twitter page. After almost a year of searching, I did it. I am free. Screw that box and manual. I don't care anymore. God bless America, I love you all. This lovely Yumi variant was mine at auction for $121, and I am elated to report that that is still the cheapest I have ever seen it go for. It also broke the record for my $127 lot of Sega Saturn games for the most tense 30 minutes of my entire life. I think the moral of the story for this one is be persistent, be patient, and above all else, don't give stupid reserve prices that no one could ever possibly hope to compete with, you know who you are. You said that the reason you wanted to kill us was so that you could get a lot of money. But was the prospect of getting all that money worth the risk of injury or perhaps even your very life? On that note, my Saturn collection ended 2017 in pretty suave condition. I started from nothing and managed to get 18 actually good games in only about 7 months, but it's far from the only thing that 2017 provided. I got a Dreamcast in September, although actually good games would have to wait for a while. Funnily enough, I wound up with the extremely uncommon Revision Zero Hollywood video model by complete accident. The system has pretty volatile problems with overheating, so not being one to overheat 
use a historical model, I eventually replaced it with a Sega Sports model from the same store, I might add, for the same price. $40. Then, the air conditioning in my house went out during an extremely hot summer, and my room is next to an attic, so I had to move a few of my things downstairs. Somehow, some way, this resulted in my Sega Sports Dreamcast blowing its infamous controller fuse, so until I can get someone to solder that, I bought a third one. Needless to say, my opinions on the Dreamcast are fairly divisive. In fairness to the Dreamcast, I bought a PS2 that Christmas, took long enough, and that didn't work either. Overall, I suppose it's just an indicative shift in focus during the sixth generation. I've been told that the same standard applies to the original Xbox, although in all fairness, I don't own one. Nowadays, I've learned to roll with the punches, so I just kind of have two PS2s and three Dreamcasts all piled up on the same shelf. It's an aesthetic that's core to the setup. Needless to say, 2017 was definitely my most prolific year in collecting video games, but all of those new consoles spread my collection pretty thin, so I devoted 2018 to filling out the gaps. I got my first import games that April, Bulk Slash on the Sega Saturn, and Socket Wars trailing closely behind, and man, what a way to start out. Even after having written a whole eulogy about Magic Knight Rare Earth, Bulk Slash is still my favorite game on the Sega Saturn by far. It's a loud mess, but it's the absolute perfect kind of loud mess, much like the console itself. Sakura Wars, by contrast, was a game that I found myself relaxing to. Casually talking to people around the theater with that impossibly cozy music was just a nice thing to wind down with, and the RPG tactics were incredibly easy, intentional or otherwise. It is not import-friendly at all, but it still managed to let off so many chill vibes that I became an instant fan of the series. In an insane twist of irony, a new Sakura Wars game was announced just a few weeks later, after 13 years of frick all. What's more, it's currently slated to come out in the West at some point during 2020, and yes, I still do plan on buying six of them. Also also, 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 just a few days after I finished writing this script, an English fan translation for the original game came out. Please go play this game! Please! After peeking at 122 titles, I also finally sold off some of the dead weight in my increasingly dusty NES collection to make way for new games. I added to my PS2 collection, bolstered my Dreamcast collection, practically doubled my Mega Drive collection, and I also finally got more use out of my Wii by getting into modding. Now I own every video game ever! I even did the unthinkable and bought some Wii U games. At the time, Toys R Us was starting to undergo its liquidation in the United States, so I figured I'd sweep the useless junk that they still had lying around, and that'll always be code for yes, I did buy Wii U games at Toys R Us. I bought Thumblestone and Lego City Undercover for literally like $3 each. The cashier even joked about how I was, quote, the third or fourth person to come in here and buy Wii U games, unquote, and I feel like in 20 years that's gonna be a very poignant statement. That very same day, I also went a few doors down to an etc. store, only to somehow find a copy of Resident Evil on the Saturn, loose, in the bargain bin for $3. I don't know how it got there, but I'm not complaining. That day was really productive, all things considered. 2018 was also the year where my bad record-keeping habits finally caught up with me. I'm usually a pretty staunch archivalist, searching for months and months to find the release date for a stall on the Sega Saturn will do that to a person, but for my collection, I had no such grand intentions. For the longest time, I was pretty easily able to catalog what I owned in my massive, big, 300 IQ brain, but after several hundred games, those same methods tend to have diminishing returns. As such, on February 7th, I took to writing down everything I had, and from it, I got my first grand total of 300 193 console games. Not handhelds. I don't collect handhelds. I'm sorry. Later, on July 6th, I figured that Notepad was decidedly not the best way to archive my collection, so I took to making an account on Backloggery. By the way, I'm not sponsored, but Backloggery is seriously a requirement if you want to effectively keep track of your collection. It's also every bit as customizable as a MySpace portal, so you know I had to make it purple all day every day. Although I still don't keep any of my Gen 2 stuff on there, it does offer me a nice, convenient total. Speaking of convenience, 2018 saw one new addition to the console lineup, which was anything but. In fact, if you've ever been into collecting, you probably share my exact experiences with the TurboGrafx-16. It's been called the ultimate cult classic machine by many, and it is unreasonably difficult to do anything with it. Likewise, I do love the TurboGrafx-16, but it does not love me back. I picked up a system, a controller, and a copy of Military Madness on September 21st for around $100, and although that sounds bad from the offset, it's honestly one of the best deals I've ever gotten in my collection. My system is still festering in a pool of coaxial static, simply because I can't support anything but the bare minimum for this console. For what it's worth, though, I have managed to build up a nice library of about 14 games. Needless to say, I fought tooth and nail to get every last one of them. Buying TurboGrafx-16 games out in the wild is out of the question, because I live in Kansas, I'm the only person I've ever even known who has one. I've only ever physically seen four games that aren't mine, and they were all from the same store. Buying online is hardly any better, considering that some of these games are so comically ludicrously rare that 15% of the library can cost over $100, and that's on a good day. Plus, if you thought the Saturn had a problem with inflated reserve prices like I did in 2017, 
2018, then I treasure your innocence. I've blown about five auctions in vain trying to get a copy of Dungeon Explorer. Logic dictates one of the most common games for the system. And when I finally won a copy, it got sent to the wrong P.O. box and someone stole it. I still don't have a copy of Dungeon Explorer. Straight up, although I don't regret buying the system, collecting for the TurboGrafx-16 is a practice in self-hate, the likes of which would make the Saturn weep at a cursory glance. As such, I've really come to cherish what little I have, and I don't care that I'm part of the problem. With all of that said, I've basically caught my collection up to the present. I got a Switch on July 5th, 2019, but it's not really sufficiently retro enough for me to say I collect for it. Plus, for a good chunk of the games that I play on modern hardware, I'm really collecting meaningless rights to execute code that I don't actually own, so it's a moot Point. As of right now, I own somewhere around 540 physical games for 18 different home consoles. My collection has come a long way since 2010. Even though the mid-500s is absolutely nothing when compared to collections on the internet, I'm still rather satisfied with how it's turned out. This is still a setup that I've had to work very hard for. Every single game on these shelves has a complete story of how I got here, and many of them have traveled across the country to call my collection their own. My collection practically exists in a vacuum, isolated by miles and miles of rural farmland, so to see as many games decorating my room as there are, especially after 10 years of growing at one pickup at a time, I'd say it's a pretty compelling view. This wall, in a very roundabout way, marks the fruit of my labors, and I have no one but myself to credit for it, as well as my parents but don't ruin the mood. Suffice it to say, I really feel like I've traveled every inch of Kansas to get this collection where it is now, spending most of my childhood and all of my teenage years to get where I am today. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. Except Super Bowling for $11. I'd probably trade it for that. Um, and she's actually Samus, that's her real name.